I collect old calculating devices as well as old computers. I have highlighted quite a few of my old calculators on two YouTube videos so far, and I thought that I would share a few interesting computers from my collection that are based on early 8-bit microprocessors. My first exposure to using computers was with a PDP-11 mini computer that my high school in Germany had, and I was one of the privileged few students to be allowed to use it. Around the same time, I listed after the MITS Altair 8800 microcomputer that had just come out. But unfortunately, on a teenager's income, it was so far remote as a possibility as to not even be really considered. The first computer that I owned personally was based on the Motorola 6800 microprocessor. Um, I had a uh, colleague in the company where I just started working who owned a Motorola Exerciser uh, microcomputer, very similar in many ways to the Altair 8800 and the M size that came out about in, in the uh, mid to late 70s. But this one did not have a bank of LEDs and toggle switches on the front, uh, but it did use the Exerciser bus, and I based my own 6800 computer on the Exerciser bus, so it could potentially use some of the uh, already made memory cards and so on, and I wouldn't have to design all those from scratch. But I did uh, hand etch the circuit boards, the motherboard, and the processor board, and did my own design for the processor. It had uh, a toggle switch and LED front panel though, unlike the Exerciser computer, and much like the Altair and the MSI computers, and actually I liked the, the look of the MSI 8080 computer with its uh, large uh, paddle type toggle switches instead of the small metal toggle switches, so I used a similar kind of switch on mine. Unfortunately, I don't have photos of that, but it looked a lot on the outside like the MSI 8080 pictured here. I was working busily on getting a monitor program written for my 6800 computer, uh, but before it was complete, uh, the Commodore PET was announced, and I bought one of the very first ones with a very low serial number. In fact, it was so low that it had a number of flaws, which Commodore eventually took it back a few months after I bought it and replaced it with one uh, with a serial number that was just high enough to be in the second batch produced, and it had a number of uh, fixes that made it more like the mainstream ones. <clears throat> That original batch had some compatibility issues and reliability issues. Anyway, so I was very involved with that pet and ended up running a large computer club, uh, national computer club really, that produced many programs and hardware peripherals for use by others. I designed and distributed what was probably the first commercially available voice synthesizer for personal computers. And I remember that the... Uh, uh, some of the schools in the city of Denver, for example, were using them to generate automated uh, announcements to the students because the kids responded better to that than to uh, live individuals speaking over the PA system. Uh, but then I moved on to the Commodore 64 and did a lot of development work for that, including selling some of my software and interfaces to a uh, large computer retailer who I won't mention the name of here, uh, but um, <clears throat> suffice to say, I was pretty heavily involved in, in the early Commodore computers. And then finally, I moved on to the uh, early IBM-type personal computers. At my engineering job, I used the Intel MCS48 family of microcontrollers, and specifically the 8048 and a couple of related processors, or actually, they were microcontrollers. I also designed, built, and programmed several test fixtures for use in my company uh, to test the products that were being made in our shop floor. And those all use the RCA Cosmac 1802 microprocessor, mostly via the pre-assembled RCA Cosmac VIP single board computer shown here. All the while I was writing machine and assembly level program code for the MOS Technology 6502 microprocessor that was made popular by its use in all the Commodore computers, as well as those by the Apple, Atari, Nintendo, and some others. Around the same time, I had a consulting partnership with another engineer 
to develop small products using the Zilog Z80 microprocessor. Most of these computers and processors are ancient history for me, but some of the early computers in my collection use some of the aforementioned processors. In this video I will be showing three computers that all represent older microprocessor and computer types, but are all reproductions in one way or another. Okay, enough history, now on to the computers. The main portion of this video is about the Altair 8800 computer, but I'm saving that for last. I will start out by showing a cute little modern implementation of an older RCA 1802 microprocessor computer called the ELF. The original ELF was a bare bones computer based on the 1802 microprocessor, being originally published as a set of plans and issues of popular electronics magazines in 1976 and 1977. It allowed basic experiments to be performed, allowing a hobbyist to assemble a working computer for very little money and in the process learn the basics of microprocessor programming. An interesting fellow named Lee Hart from Minnesota who experiments with electric cars and does all sorts of vintage computer work and is a general all-around enthusiast for vintage computers designed and produced a kit called the 1802 membership card and it is really just the earlier elf computer design but laid out on a stack of circuit boards so that it will all fit into a tin of Altoids mints. It's on two circuit boards plus the third circuit board which gets soldered onto the back of the Altoids tin after the back's been cut out and uh, you can buy it just with the processor itself, you can buy it with the control panel, and you can buy it with the so-called faceplate. I chose to buy the assembly of all three. Assuming you buy the whole package, it has eight toggle switches and eight LEDs, one push button, and three other toggle switches for program control. It also has a single bicolor LED which is tied to the Q line. It comes with 32K of RAM and it's also possible according to the website to add another 32K of RAM or ROM to it. It has an 8-bit I.O. port and a serial I.O. port both brought out to this DB25 connector and if you're using an appropriate program on ROM it can communicate serially with another computer over its serial port. As it comes however it can be used as a small microcontroller in much the way that an Arduino or Raspberry Pi computer can although obviously at a lower level of capability. But I only bought this one to relive my old days when I used to do a lot of 1802 programming and this seemed like a, a cute end simple way to be able to execute 1802 code. Now a few words about the 1802 itself. RCA produced this original microprocessor starting in uh, 1976. The chip is made out of uh, CMOS technology. Uh, I think it was one of the first if not the first microprocessor to do so and it has no minimum clock frequency and lowering the clock speed at times, uh, whenever you can get away with it, can result in ultra low power use. Indeed this uh, clock on here can be slowed all the way down to zero hertz, in which case the processor is essentially in a zero power sleep state. And then you can wake it up by going extremely slowly with the clock or bring it up to its full clock rate and dynamically control the clock as required. If you have very low processing requirements and can take the time to do it, you can bring it down to a very, uh, very slow clock rate and when you need more processing power you can ramp it up to a higher clock rate. This makes it very flexible. So many other microprocessors would stop working with anything below a fairly high clock rate and many of them just suck power like crazy so the 1802 is really an interesting processor for that reason. It has an 8-bit data bus and an 8-bit address bus which is unusual for most 8-bit processors which have 16-bit address buses. However it does use 16-bit addresses internally so it gets 
through to the memory by using the 8-bit address bus in two alternate 8-bit cycles. It also has a rather unique single-bit port called Q, which is fully programmable and testable. This is a good way to use the chip for diagnostics. You can use the Q line to implement a serial port and for lots of other reasons. And it has a nice set of dedicated instructions just to support the uh, Q pin. The 1802 was also available in a version built on the so-called silicone on sapphire technology or SOS which gives it a considerable resistance to radiation and electrostatic discharge. This makes it very useful for military applications and this along with the ultra low power consumption has made it a very popular uh, processor in satellites and other man-made spacecraft. As just one example, the Galileo spacecraft used approximately 20 of these 1802 processors in its design. So now I'm going to go over a few of the details on here. These are just support logic chips and everything on here is using chips that were available in the early 18, I'm sorry, in the early 1980s. So there's no newer chips on here that they could have gotten away with. It's all using chips of the appropriate vintage to the processor itself although I'm not sure about the fairly large size RAM chip here that may be a little bit newer but it's certainly the same kind of technology. There's some configuration jumpers and then these are uh, port drivers here. Uh, there's a super cap on the board for long-term memory retention with the power turned off and there's a ceramic resonator and uh, this is used for the clock of the processor and there's a trim pot where you can adjust that and change the clock up and down quite a lot. This doesn't allow it to go completely down to DC but you can certainly mess around with the clock. It's on a nice double-sided circuit board and then it has a large pin header here for communication to the outside world. The interface board of the 18 and 2 membership card um, has a little bit of glue logic on it. A couple of uh, there's a CMOS 7400 series IC and a uh, 4000 series CMOS IC, so both CMOS logic chips. There's the power connector, the DB25 connector, uh, a few configuration jumpers which is used I think mostly for the serial port. Uh, you can design several electrical characteristics in and out. There's some resistor networks. There's the LED bank of course. Uh, there are the push buttons and toggle switches and of course the header to connect it back to the main board. And the entire assembly ends up like this, very tightly packaged. And then the whole thing, and you can see here how the back of the Altoids tin has been cut out. It's very thin metal and it's tin plated uh, steel I believe. And that allows the uh, all uh, tinned copper backside of this board to be just simply flow soldered around the periphery to hold it on. And it's a tight fit but it does go in here. Just barely fits. And uh, the kit does come with a full complement of nuts for the switches, but since I take it in and out of the case quite a bit, I just put two of them on at the ends of the switches.
so that's on there now and then I've cut a piece of mylar could be paper as well just to make sure that if I squeeze the tin that the pins on the back of the board don't get shorted out but there it is it, except for the protruding switches and LEDs it really does fit inside the Altoids tin now there is no power supply in here there's just not room for batteries or a power supply and so I took another Altoids tin and uh, basically put a, uh, a battery pack in there with double uh, A cells and uh, brought it out to a pin header which uh, goes into the connector here and one interesting thing about this is you can continue to run a program on here even with the LEDs turned off in which case there's almost no power consumption in here it's all CMOS and it uses very little power uh, so the design allows you to have a ground pin and a pin to power the LED common and a pin to allow the processor to run and then a uh, V plus pin for the rest of the circuitry and so basically I've just got uh, three toggle switches here and uh, turning one of them on applies power to the V plus pin turning the next one on applies power to the uh, run pin and turning the third one on applies power to the LED pin so I don't have to mess around with jumpers on here to select different modes of powering it so we're going to do a little bit of playing around here I can identify which side of the plug is plus by the red cord first an overview of the control pins on here there's no direct control of the address bus on this unlike some of the bigger microcontrollers you can't just force in an address you pretty much need to start at the low end and then in other words by resetting it and then uh, incrementing through it so pretty limited there and you don't want to be doing any very large programs this way however using the port here you can use a PC to force data into memory and read out of memory and thereby use sort of a monitor program in your PC to program this for larger programs but I kind of like messing with the toggle switches as long as the program isn't too big so there's uh, the in button here this is a momentary button and pushing it toggles whatever's on the switches into RAM and as soon as it's in RAM the LEDs will reflect what you just loaded there's a pair of switches here which I'll get to in a minute but then there's this other switch which is called read write it's sort of mislabeled for brevity but in the right position you can read or write memory but this is primarily used while you're programming and once you put it to the read position that makes the memory read only so it can't be messed up accidentally these two middle switches are used in three ways one way is to by turning the one up and one down you can have weight up and clear down in which case you're telling the processor to temporarily halt running it just goes into a sleep state but everything is remaining intact so you can turn it back to normal operation at any time uh, and then the clear is used to clear memory or not clear memory but it allows you to clear the address counter and go back to an address of all zeros for primarily for resetting and for uh, loading a small program in and then to actually run the program you have to turn both of those on the toggle switches as formerly mentioned are used only for toggling in data they're not used for address access at all and the LEDs only reflect the status of memory not addresses so it's about as basic as you can get the uh, ELF computer that this is based on is just the same uh, except that instead of the eight LEDs it used a couple of more chips 
and it decoded the hexadecimal data on the data lines into two uh, a two-digit LED display that could read anywhere from zero up to F the hexadecimal uh, range so uh, that made it a little easier to program but there isn't much of a trick to remembering the hexadecimal codes in binary so in the name of saving the space that a couple more ICs would have taken and keeping it simple this uh, my membership card version of the ELF does everything with just these eight LEDs so let's put in a tiny little program it's only uh, I think it's four bytes long but it actually does something which is kinda cool so we'll start out by toggling in this program first we have to set up the uh, 1802 for program entry so the first thing we want to do is use the clear switch to reset the 1802's address bus to all zeros and that's done by setting it's actually kind of intuitive the switch down does the clear so we but it only works when it's the only one of these two that's down so by leaving it down and turning the other switch up we have just cleared the processor. With the address bus cleared back to 000, we turn this switch on, which enables write access to the memory. And then finally, we bring this switch down to load. So both these switches are down, and that together means load memory. Now that nothing's been loaded yet, so the LEDs are all off. Let's put in the first uh, byte. It's hexadecimal 7B. So looking at the first four switches, we turn these three on to make a hexadecimal 7. And then in the right bank, we turn on the first and these two to make a hexadecimal B. and then we load that into memory by pushing the uh, in button. Just a second ago, but not shown in the video, I had forgotten I had the LED power supply turned off, so um, the Q light was not lit up, but I've turned that on off camera and now so that's lit up and as soon as we push the in button here, uh, it'll load the hexadecimal 7B into memory. And the next byte is 7A, which is almost the same, except uh, on this one I need to toggle these two switches to be an A. Let's see, one, two, three. On, off, on, off. And it's reflected on the LEDs. And the next uh, byte is three zero, so there's three, and these four are all off to get three zero. Load memory, and the fourth byte is all zeros. Now let's go back and check and see if the program loaded correctly. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is reset the address counter by turning this switch here up that resets it and then put this switch in read-only mode so we don't inadvertently screw something up with memory and then take this switch down to this position and when we push the in button the first time that brings up the contents of the uh, first memory location hexadecimal 7 hexadecimal B. Pushing in again gives us the 7A. Pushing it again gives us the hexadecimal 3. Pushing it again gives us the hexadecimal 0. So now the program has been verified and we have to reset the address counter once again. We're going to leave the memory and write 
and we're going to raise this switch to clear the address counter back to zero and as it shows here both these middle switches need to be up in order for it to run so simply pushing this switch up here puts it in run and we can see that the Q LED went to a sort of an orange color this program is simply toggling the Q LED or the Q output of the 1802 on and off as fast as it possibly can as the program runs. There are no time delays in it. It's just ripping through at full speed, toggling that on and off. And since this LED is reflecting the status of that, it's alternating between green and red, which gives us this kind of orangish color uh, that's sort of in between. Well, that doesn't sound too thrilling, but one thing I can do is I've got a little computer speaker over here, and I'm going to bring in the leads from that. <clears throat> this is the Q line brought out to the DB25 connector, so it's the same signal. We can see we have an audio tone there, and this hole here gives access to the trim pot if I can find it. There we go. That's about as low as it goes. The trim pot's a little bit intermittent there. are these connections here. Um, <clears throat> now I can put the processor in wait and it just suspends the program exactly where it is without messing anything up and then putting it back into run resumes. Wait. Resume. So there's a very simple program running in the 1802. So for a little bit of fun here, I'm going to uh, put in a slightly larger program. This will be similar to the one we just ran, but it'll have a built-in time delay, which will enable the uh, LED on the Q line to be seen flashing. So once again, I'm going to put the processor in wait. put the memory in write mode and bringing this switch up also reset the program counter or the address counter so now it's ready to start putting in data the first code is F8 so that's all on and 8 F8 and then zero 08, zero 08, then B2, which is on, off, on, on, and 2, B2, and then 22, 22, and then 92, 92 and then 3A three 3A three then 03 then CD CD, 
and then 7B Seven B, then three eight, three eight, then seven A, seven A, then three zero, three zero, and then zero zero. Let's uh, reset the counter. First I'm going to uh, bring this up here so the only one down is clear. And then I'm going to put the memory in read only mode. And then I'm going to release this. And I'm going to check my memory real quick. 7, 8, 0, 8, B2, 22, 92, 3A, 0, 03, C, D, 7B, 38, 7A, three zero and zero zero so the program is in there good now let's just go ahead and once again reset the program counter and then bring both these up for running the program <clears throat> And you can see the QLED is cycling on and off. Because this is driven by a time delay in the program, which itself is associated with the clock speed. That's about as slow as it goes, I think. See if I can speed it up at all. There we go. So there is a slightly more complicated program running in the 1802, and you can see how the user interface is done. However, there's no immediate way to go into here and interrogate memory in any specific location without just doing it the way I did it to check the program a minute ago by clearing the address counter and then single stepping all the way through and unless you keep track of where you are in the program once you get into it a few bytes you may forget which address has which byte in it and there's nothing here to tell you so again very rudimentary but still about as bare bones as it can be and still be useful And as I showed before, I can halt it. You can see that sometimes I'm catching it red, red, green, red, green because it's still going slow enough I can catch it with it toggled one way or the other. So, the 1802 processor and the uh, Cosmac ELF computer design as implemented by Lee Hart in his 1802 membership card kit. My experience with the Z80 microprocessor is very limited, but after I had made Lee Hart's 1802 membership card, he advised me that he had also had a similar kit designed and produced based on the Z80, so I had to buy one for my collection. The Z80 was introduced in 1976, the same year as the 1802, 
introduced by Zilog, a small startup company with a handful of employees. It was designed as a sort of enhanced 8080 microprocessor, the same processor that was used in the famous Altair 8800, but with more programming capabilities, a larger instruction set, and other enhanced features. While it was not PIN compatible with the 8080, it could run software written for the 8080. While never all that popular in the home personal computer world, it was widely used in the higher end personal computers, especially those that ran the CPM operating system, as well as in music synthesizers and arcade games and machines and some military equipment, along with the MOS Technology 6502 microprocessor, uh, it was the most commonly used microprocessor of the 1980s according to most surveys I've seen. The Z80 membership card is a fancier product than its 1802 based inspiration uh, in that it had a monitor program in ROM, a hexadecimal keyboard of sorts, and an LED alphanumeric display with a few status LEDs thrown in. It comes with a 32K RAM um, <clears throat> here as well as a, a 32K ROM which has its operating system in it. Uh, it has one 8-bit input port, one 8-bit output port, a serial I.O. port, and some interrupt I.O. Like the 1802 membership card, it fits into an Altoids tin. However, because of the fact it doesn't have toggle switches and LEDs poking out, the whole thing actually fits into the tin. As with the uh, 1802 membership card, it can be used as a standalone trainer to learn Z80 machine code programming, and it can also be used as a controller for small projects, much as you might use an Arduino chip. I have been begging Lee Hart to make a membership card based on the Motorola 6800 or one of its closely related microprocessors, but unlike the 1802 and the Z80, Actual 6800 family ICs are no longer produced and thus supply of those chips is uncertain and prices for what you can find are quite high. I think he's still exploring the possibility of using uh, a newer 18 or 6800 derivative which would still use a similar instruction set and it might be somewhat useful but not as uh, clean a match as these. So anyway, um, let's put this together and make it do something. First off, uh, a bit of a review of the board. This is more packed in that it has more functionality than the 1802 product. There is some glue logic here, all 7400 CMOS family stuff, a voltage regulator, the aforementioned RAM, ROM, and the Z80 processor itself. And there are two long pin headers on the circuit board, both ends, but uh, only this one brings out the address and the data bus and the other one is for I.O. Um, the front panel board really doesn't use the I.O. Uh, and it does use some of, well, I should step back on that. It uses selected pins from both ports and uh, it has some glue logic underneath here to scan the hexadecimal keyboard which doesn't have any printing on the keys, but on the circuit board it does have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then A, B, C, D, E, and F. Kind of an odd arrangement, but there it is. Uh, and then there's a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 segment LED display, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 uh, LEDs for status of various sorts. There's a power connector here and uh, it's possible to stack these in different ways to bring out the I.O. pins for other uses but as it goes together here it's only using what it needs to support this board. So I have to make sure I have the right connector because they're not keyed in any way. P1 goes to... let's see... P1's there, that's the I.O. pin, and P2 here is the the other bus, so this is P2 there. I have to make sure I line that side up as well. It only takes a few pins out. I think it's mostly getting power from that. 
other connector, come to think of it. So there's the whole package. And once again, I've cut a little piece of mylar. It could be cardboard or paper as well, just to keep the pins from shorting out to the case when it drops into the Altoids tin. And once again, it's a very close fit, but it does drop in there. Computer in a can. So because of the reflectivity of the uh, Altoids tin under these lights, um, I put a washcloth across this to just blot it out. I would just run it outside of the can, but then you tend to grab other parts of the circuit board and uh, then I really want to be holding on to, so um, we'll do it this way. I'm plugging in the power supply here, and it comes up with cold zero zero, which is a status. Um, <clears throat> now a reset is a F key and a zero key held down together, which is these two. This does have a full monitoring program in here, which is even capable of monitoring the program operation during program execution, unlike many monitor programs on small microprocessors. This one is more uh, fully functional. So every key, as previously mentioned, has a hexadecimal function for entering data and addresses. And I don't know if it's you can see it, I'm thinking it's not too clear under the LEDs here, but I'm blotting out the lights. You can kind of see there's a green LED here. These status LEDs are not the greatest thing about this design. They're very dim. You can see them in a more normally lit environment, but if you have any bright lights over your work table or anything, they're really hard to make out. I've been seriously considering replacing this with some additional LEDs, but this whole thing is a LED package that includes both the uh, seven segment LEDs as well as the status ones, so uh, it's not like it's easy to break these out. I kind of wish that he'd done this a little differently, but oh well. Um, <clears throat> This key is also a step key. This is an advance key. Most of these have a shift function, and the F key down here is also the shift key. Uh, so if you use that, holding it down, and then pressing one of the other keys, you can get secondary functions, like this is a go key, this is in, this is out, this is back, uh, these two are a hard reset, these two are a soft reset. This shifted is a register key. Uh, I already mentioned this is a shift key. This is memory key. This is a modify key. Uh, this also has a function IX, IY, IR, AF prime, DE, HL, PC, BC prime, SP, AF, BC, DE prime, uh, so there's a, quite a few different functions. Uh, you can select a different register to view, such as the SP register, the AF register, the BC register. You can go to a specific program location and run it at, a, uh, at the current program counter. You can read an input port you can write out to an output port. You can step through one instruction at a time in the program counter. You can examine a memory location that you specify. Uh, once a register memory or I.O. command starts, you can advance to move ahead one location. You can back up to move back one location. You can modify the contents of the current location. 
and uh, depending on the type of location it can be uh, two digits hexadecimal or four digits hexadecimal and then the aforementioned soft and hard resets let's cold boot this again so we're sitting in a cold boot mode uh, and it's reading zero zero because it's the first time it's been booted since it's powered up this was a boot and a power up at the same time uh, so uh, as mentioned before I can do the uh, the boot there and it comes up with the green here again I'll try to block out the lights a little bit to make it show up a little better this is I written in with a sharpie it's monitor this is the thing telling you you're in monitor mode instead of in run mode there's basically just two modes run and monitor mode and the next LED position over is the one for run uh, there are the nine keypad commands for example if I want to examine memory I push the E key which is mnemonically useful for examine and this is the E key here so I push examine and then F oops let's see there we go F F um, one so location FFF1 is a so-called tick counter which is part of the monitor program and it's always counting up and since I'm monitoring once again I'm in monitor mode and I'm monitoring this address location in memory and it's counting up in hexadecimal and it's basically doing that in real time and there's very little delay in the monitor so it's pretty much what it is at that moment you can see it only goes up to FF and then resets the A key is mnemonically associated with advance the reflections in my eyes off the Altoids tin were driving me nuts so I got rid of the can for the moment um, anyway so I'm back in FFF1 here uh, counting up and I can push the A key to advance to FFF2 which just shows me the contents of that at this given moment or I could use the B key which is here mnemonically associated with back up to show the previous contents and there we are showing the tick counter again and here's some rapidly changing value and a static value and another rapidly changing value etc so you can step through the program in this way I don't know if you can hear it or not but there's a piezoelectric buzzer here that just makes the slightest little pinging sound um, and you can't get all the status on this from just the LED display here it's also important to see these LEDs come on and for sake of uh, being able to see it a little better I'm going to turn off some of my illumination here see if I can get it to show up a little better so um, I'm going to push the exam button and it lights up an LED you can just barely see it light up there very briefly then it went off I'll do that again and that tells you it's ready for me to enter a memory address only as long as it's lit up so I can go zero 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 and now it shows me the location of address zero and uh, if I want to examine again once again I push exam that lights up again and I can go let me do that again here um, examine F F F one and I'm back to reading the tick counter
So in this way you can kind of see how you get around in the built-in um, monitor program. The zero button is the command to look at a register and uh, again it's going to be kind of hard to see it here with the uh, lighting but let's see what happens when I push that it lit up the register button and then it or the register indicator then it went out so you can see by doing that that it gives me a moment to start typing in a register and the registers are identified on here uh, by pushing the one through the D buttons where one is the SP register, two is AF, three is BC, C is DE, four is DE, five is HL, six is PC, B is BC, seven is IX, eight is IY, and nine is IR, uh, etc. So uh, by pushing this I can take a look at the IX register so I press the register, then I button 7, and that's the way it tries to show you the IX. That's its abbreviation for IX, and there's 0000, 0, 0, 0 hexadecimal in the IX register. Or I could look at IR, which is the number 9 key, and it shows IR and the contents of that register. Same thing, AF or AF prime as it's shown here. So you can get around and look at all your registers. I already showed how to look at memory. Uh, you can modify and so on. Uh, I'm not going to try to show an actual program running on this uh, because of the interface on here to try to get it to do anything useful takes a longer time to type in and it's also running a program right now in the form of the monitor program so uh, I don't think it's all that beneficial to try to type in a program to demonstrate that the thing runs. Uh, but you can see it's a pretty nice little package. I think the major impediments to really making it usable is that these LEDs are awfully dim and that the it's a little hard to remember unless you use it a lot which key does what because it doesn't say what they are on the key and most of them it has a function written down on the circuit board but the top row it does not uh, at least not where you can easily see it and unless you have a chart you can't remember what the secondary and tertiary functions of the keys are and luckily they do give you a a chart in the manual that shows what all those are but you almost need to keep that next to you when you're working with it um, I also find that even though I have this uh, insulator in the back of the case. It's slightly undersized as you can see here. It doesn't quite go to the edge and there are live pins that are right along the edge that can be shorted out. So if I were to use this more than I have, which is really just for demonstrations, I would have to make a newer insulator to make sure it doesn't occasionally short out. But still kind of a cool product. Um, I should note that the soft and hard reset are a little different than I had it before. Um, the hard reset as I mentioned is pushing these two and the soft reset when you push these two buttons it doesn't seem to do anything. But then when you follow with the hard reset buttons then it does the soft reset. So once again, and it tells you how many times it's done it. That's the third time I've done a soft reset. So push down the soft reset buttons, push down the hard reset buttons, and it does, in this case, the fourth soft reset. Or I can just push down the hard reset buttons, and it does a hard reset. And that's the seventh time I've done it since I powered it up. So I think that's enough of a tour of this product.
So I'd like to talk about my uh, Altair 8800 today. This is uh, not an old Altair 8800. In fact, it is uh, only a couple of years old. And it was produced in Texas by AltairClone.com. This is in the same form factor, same size, same colors, a virtually identical case, some very small differences, exact copy of the front panel. Including the positions and the artwork and the functionality is very accurately copied and it emulates quite a bit of original Altair hardware <clears throat> using a modern microprocessor and memory internally uh, so you don't have the reliability issues you have with the old Altair 8800s uh, and it's really good for demonstration purposes and just for seeing how the old Altair 8800s worked um, without having to be constantly futzing around with it to try to keep old connectors and parts that can be hard to get if they fail. Um, so for my collection, I decided to go this route uh, instead of trying to find an old Altair and spending a boatload of money and then having constant reliability problems with it. Um, I'm afraid that it's hard to get a good picture in here, but... Uh, I'm going to do some overviews and run some programs, both high level and machine code level, to try to give a pretty good overview of this. And uh, <clears throat> I actually use this uh, when I'm not taking it out and doing demos with it. I just like having it on display in my laboratory here, which is also my recording studio. Um, <clears throat> but back around behind the recording bench and uh, it makes a good platform for my uh, Primera Bravo 4100 auto printer which I use to produce CDs and DVDs it's about exactly the same size and rises it up to a good level without blocking anything important on the Altair and then right next to it behind a big open reel deck is uh, a notebook computer that I normally use just to run the uh, auto printer but it's in a good location to also use as a terminal for the Altair 8800 and uh, both pieces of equipment being located right behind the computer works out pretty well and uh, for the curious the program I'm using is one called TerraTerm and it's actually provided uh, it's a freeware program and AltairClone.com provides TerraTerm on request with the computers when you buy them and uh, it's very comprehensive and easy to use I can get in and alter the internal configuration of the Altair for example renaming and loading and changing uh, the, the virtual disk drives inside and I can also just use it as a general terminal for when I'm running basic or CPM or something for demonstration purposes. Um, <clears throat> this is a fairly new computer although it's a, a low-end uh, Dell. Um, I think it's an Inspiron 150 or something like that and I did that because it was cheap. I think it cost me $300 for a dedicated computer like this that I don't hardly take anywhere. Again, if I'm going to demonstrate the Altair, I'll take it out with me. Otherwise, it's really just here to run the auto printer. But um, <clears throat> uh, Altair Clone, also on request, provides this um, USB to RS-232 adapter along with its driver software and that gets me from a computer that doesn't have RS-232 to having an RS-232 port and then that's just run over an RS-232 cable into the back of the Altair into one of its two serial ports that it comes with from the factory. Uh, so that simple arrangement works very well for uh, doing the higher level stuff with the Altair.
Okay, so here's a an overview of the Altair 8800. This is a clone of the actual Altair 8800 in a full-size case with a exact duplicate of the front panel and running a modern microprocessor inside that exactly emulates both the hardware of the 8080 microprocessor used in the Altair as well as the hardware circuits in the Altair and other aspects such as the serial I.O. card for communication, communication to uh, my terminal as well as the floppy disk controller and three floppy disk drives which I have uh, already loaded up. They're essentially non-volatile flash memory. I've got them loaded up with uh, CPM operating system, Altair Basic, and uh, the Altair DOS. Um, <clears throat> and there's also a couple utilities in there, such as a, a disk bootloader and some other things. Anyway, this uh, computer passes many rigorous tests for duplication of the original Altair. Uh, to the point where you can't really tell the difference between them in operation or appearance and uh, It will even do things like playing fool on the hill or other music over an AM radio uh, which the original Altair would do but the uh, Most of the other clones that have been produced will not do that um, So I'm going to give a bit of an overview of the front of the computer First, I'm going to do a reset. I had it running uh, another program there, and now I'm terminated out. Um, I apologize for the angle of the view here. I've got very little room for my vintage computers, and this computer is sort of jammed in in the side of a hallway. <laughs> and. Uh, the camera is up against the other wall and it's as close as I can get it so I think you can see almost the entire uh, front panel of the Altair at least everything important um, off to the far left and actually out of the picture is the power switch just over here where my fingers pointing and then the operational switches are all in one row here and then the bank of 16 switches which have three different uses are along here and then there's uh, a couple of status lights and a bank of 16 LEDs for showing the status of the address bus and then a bank of eight LEDs for showing the data coming out of memory at a specific address as displayed on the address LEDs and then a bank of status LEDs along here. The ones I need to look at most are these, these, and this one right here, the white light. So a quick overview of the switches from left to right. The first switch is a stop run switch. Um, it's center locate or uh, spring return to center and it can be pushed up momentarily to stop the running program, return to center, or push down against a spring to initiate running the current program. There's a single step switch which causes the uh, microprocessor to single step through the program one memory cycle at a time. And by memory cycle I'm referring to going to the current memory address and extracting whatever is in memory at that location and then loading that into the processor and in some instances a command in machine language would be only a single memory cycle but in most cases it's going to be multiple memory cycles for example two cycles or three for example if you wanted to load in a memory address the first code in machine code would be the command itself to load something into memory and then since the memory is 16 bits 
an upper order and a lower order, eight bits each, it takes two more memory cycles to load in the lower and the upper order of the address. So a simple load memory instruction takes up three memory cycles. Anyway, so single stepping goes through the program that's in there one memory cycle at a time and all of the microprocessor status bits are brought out to these LEDs so by single stepping and watching all these LEDs you can see in great detail what's going on in the processor and troubleshoot your program that way especially if you don't have any other tools available to you. The next switch is spring return up, spring return down, normally located in the center position. Pushing it up against the spring causes the computer to go to the memory location specified here and get whatever data is at that memory location and display it here. And so it's called examine because it examines a specific memory location. Pushing it down against the spring causes it to automatically increment to the next address from the one that was shown and then go get the memory at that location and display it. So if you want to look at just one location you'd use the switch in the up position for examine. If you want to look through multiple memory locations you would toggle it up and down here to the examine next position and step through your program looking at each sequential memory location. The next switch does the same thing, but instead of viewing or examining memory, it puts something into memory. So if you have a memory location shown here, and then you set the rightmost switches, which are the data switches, to the data you want to go in the memory location that's shown here, and then push the switch up against the spring to the deposit position, it's going to take those switches and put that data into that memory location and if you want to do multiple memory locations loading one after another it's the same way you start with the first one and deposit it and then you set the next set of switches and deposit next by pushing the switch down that increments to the next memory location and deposits there then you set the switches again for the third position do a deposit next and so on and so on the next switch is the reset clear and Basically what that does is it resets the microprocessor, tells it to stop doing what it's doing, reset the program counter back to zero. But it does not in and of itself stop the processor from actually running. By resetting it, it aborts whatever it was doing and forces it back to memory location zero. And if you haven't stopped it otherwise, it's just going to pick up at memory location zero and continue running. Assuming your program starts at memory location zero, that would cause the program itself to reset and start running fresh. If your program doesn't start at memory location zero, you probably want to stop the processor before doing a reset or you'll get some weird results. So the proper reset is to push the switch up into the stop position and then push the reset up and then release them this leaves you in memory location zero with the processor doing nothing. But if the processor is running and you're in a program that starts at zero, you can just force it to reset and continue running by momentarily going to reset. The next switch is also normally in its center position and by pushing it up, it protects memory. If you push it down, it unprotects memory. This doesn't do anything with the actual CPU but instead it's used by some memory boards uh, that you could have in the Altair to protect the memory from being changed inadvertently, for example, or to unprotect it. And the way that's implemented is really up to the manufacturer of the uh, memory board and might not even be implemented up by some memory boards. So in this particular Altair, using uh, modern virtual memory, well, it's real memory, but it's not. It, it's emulating specific memory boards. Uh, this really doesn't do anything. And then there's two aux buttons, which don't do anything in the original Altair, but they can be wired up to do specific things in any particular implementation of the Altair. On this particular Altair, the aux switch is used for certain things, uh, while the right-hand one isn't used for anything. 
So let's go up to the next row, and I already mentioned that the address bus can be set to a specific address by setting all these 16 toggle switches from bit 0 up through bit 15 and they're arranged in groups of three to make them a little easier to, to think of them in octal where everything is viewed in groups of three. It's a little easier than hexadecimal on the Altair broke it up that way. Some other computers would arrange everything according to hexadecimal. Working with the Altair is easiest if you think in octal for most things instead of hexadecimal. Uh, then once you've set your address bus you can enter data by using the rightmost switches in their second function which is to set data instead of setting an address and since the data is only 8 bits you only use these 8 switches and then finally uh, the leftmost switches when the program is actually running those can be interrogated by the program and used for various things like operator input already talked about how the contents of the address bus are displayed on these 16 LEDs and whatever is currently in the memory location shown here is displayed on these data LEDs. Now I just reset this, I'm going to do it again and you'll see there's some data there. Well, why is there data there? That's because the memory powers up randomly and there could be anything in a memory location until you specifically put something in that location. So I'm going to set everything down to zero and redo my reset and do an examine of location zero. Well that's what I was already doing so it was showing this data. Now if I want to examine next, I push it down and you can see that it's incremented the lowest bit on the address bus so I'm looking at location 1 and there is some different data there. Examining next, again, I can just step through and see what random data is in this computer. Pushing the reset button once again tells the CPU to set the address counter back to all zeros. So I didn't even need to tell it to do that by a specific examine. And I think I already touched on it, but just in case I didn't, the white light here is telling you if the program, if the CPU is doing anything. And in this case it is not. It's in the wait mode because the wait LED is turned on. If the program is running, this light is either completely off or depending on how the program is written and what it's busy doing at the moment, it might occasionally go into the wait state and you'll see that as either a flickering wait light or the wait light being on but being rather dim. But if it's on bold and steady like this, this means nothing is going on. So I'm going to load in a little program. This is one of the first programs written for the Altair. Some people would say the first, but certainly one of the first programs, and it's called Kill the Bit. It's a pretty short program. It's easily entered without spending too much time, and it is located at memory location zero, so once again, very easy to work with. And this is the program in hexadecimal, And here is the program rewritten in Octal to make it easier to enter into the Altair. So to do this, once again, it's always good to do a stop reset. Make sure the processor is in its uh, reset mode and the address bus is set to zero. The first uh, command in the program is Octal code 41. And so I'm looking here there's actually two bits of the third octal digit, three bits of the middle octal digit, and three bits of the least significant octal digit. 
and it's actually code 041 in octal. So this needs to be 0, this needs to be 4, and remember how this works. Octal is just binary grouped in values from 0 to 7, or 8 values. So if I put this up, that would be a 1. If I put this up, that would be a 2. If I put both these up, that would be a 3. If I put this up, that would be a 4, which is what I want. So right now I've got 0, 4, and over here, put that up for a 1. And you'll notice that the LEDs are not displaying that because I've not actually put anything into that memory location yet. So I'm going to do a deposit, and now you'll see the LEDs are showing 0, 4, 1 in octal. The next byte of the program is all zeros, and so now I can do a deposit next, which sets the address 1 ahead and then deposits in that location. And you can see that I'm now at address 1, and there's zeros in that location, which is what I wanted. There's zeros in the next location, according to the program, so I'll do another deposit next. And now there should be a 26, which is 2, 4, 5, 6. 0, 2, Six. So I'll do a deposit next. And then a two zero zero deposit next. And a zero zero one deposit next. And a zero one six deposit next and then a zero 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 deposit next a zero three two deposit next another zero three two deposit next another zero three two deposit next another zero three two deposit next then a zero one one zero one one deposit next a three two two three two two deposit next a zero one zero zero one zero deposit next and a zero 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 deposit next a three 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 deposit next a three seven seven which is all those bits turned on deposit next a two five two two five two Deposit next. A zero one seven zero one seven deposit next. A one two seven one two seven deposit next. A three oh three three oh three deposit next. A zero one zero deposit next and finally a zero 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 deposit next so the same thing to do here is always to go back and look at the program make sure it's really what you think it is so I'm gonna do a reset and I'm showing up here at address location zero I'm showing a 4, 1, and now I'm going to do a uh, examine next, and it should be 0, 
the next one should be 0, the next one should be 2, 6, 2, 6, the next one should be 2, 0, 0, which is correct. The next one should be 0, 0, 1, which is correct. Next one is 0, 1, 6, that's correct. Next one is 0, 0, 0, 0, 3, 2, 0, 3, 2, 0, 3, 2, 0, 3, 2, 0, 1, 1, 3, 2, 2, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 3, 3, 3, 3, 7, 7, 2, 5, 2, 0, 1, 7, 1, 2, 7, 3, 0, 3, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 0. So to make this run, all I should need to have to do is reset the program counter back to 0 and put the program in run. And there it's running. You can see that the white light is no longer on way over here and there's also this activity which indicates that the program is operational. Now ignoring the left hand side for the moment, this is the actual program running over here. You can see the data being accessed and different addresses. It's kind of flickering that may not show up too well on the camera. And what the program is doing is very occasionally it's accessing the upper order memory locations very briefly just long enough to get the LED to turn on and it's doing it in a way that cycles through these eight LEDs and the name of this game is kill the bit and you kill it sort of like space invaders by waiting till the LED comes by and then trying to turn the appropriate switch on which the program is reading in time to kill the bit so let's see if I can get lucky here oh now I made it worse by doing it wrong Oh, I made it really hard now. The program does get progressively harder as you screw up. So how do I fix that? I just go back and reset it and get it back to its simpler mode. Ah, but I left it on and that was treated as making it worse so once again I'm going to reset it and I'm going to try to be quicker with my switch ah that time I got it I was on and off very quickly while it was on that LED if I left it on while it went to the next LED it would have turned more LEDs on and made it even harder like it did before let's try it again reset the program running the program again this time I'm going to wait till it comes over here and let's see oh now I've made it really hard on myself now I've got it down to two LEDs ah I got it so two successful rounds of playing kill the bit game so that's an example of some rudimentary operation of the Altair 8800 through its front panel to enter a program, to check a program, and to run a program and then play a little simple game that takes only a handful of uh, bytes of memory to do. Uh, in many ways this is, this is almost as much fun as some of the early Space Invaders games especially when you think about how clever the program is to uh, do apparently so much with so little programming very clever uh, program writing and now I'm going to stop the program the white light comes back on and I've just got whatever I've got there I reset it and uh, I'm back to reading a 41 at memory location 0 so I could run it again 
or I could change the program and do something else. All right, so this Altair um, has three disk drives in it. Um, the original Altair would have had a floppy drive controller circuit board and uh, several, up to several, I think, I don't know if three was the maximum or not, but at least three floppy drives could be connected. Um, <clears throat> and this Altair has a simulated uh, or emulated um, version of the driver card, the floppy driver card that is, and three simulated Altair floppy disk drives. And each of them is loaded already with the uh, exact image from the original floppies for uh, the uh, 56K, I think it was, CPM operating system and Altair DOS and also the uh, so-called Altair Disk Basic which was uh, an early Microsoft product and in order to get it to run the card always wants to or it always needs to be booted into one of those systems DOS, BASIC, or CPM, and the way it's set up, it's going to boot from whichever one's in drive zero. So I've already used my terminal emulator to go into the Altair and tell it essentially that the uh, BASIC program is in virtual disk drive zero. So when I do the following procedure, it's going to basically be using its little boot program booting from virtual drive zero and thereby booting into disk basic so the first thing I need to do is make sure that the uh, computer is completely reset so I do that by forcing it to stop and then doing a reset and you can see that all the address LEDs are zero and it's in a wait state so there's nothing running. So the next thing to do is to set the Altair to the proper address of the disk bootloader program um, which happens to be at hex address FF00 and I do that by setting the first eight bits or the highest order address bits all to ones and the lowest order ones all to zeros so if you're familiar with hexadecimal it's taking the 16-bit address in four bit sections so the first four are all up that's a hexadecimal F the next four are all up that's another hexadecimal F the next th uh, four are down or zero, which is a hex zero, and the last or least significant uh, address bits are also hex zero, so FF00. And with this in place, I'd raise the examine switch, which sets the address bus equal to what the switches are. Once again, FF00 and it's no longer looking at these switches. The bus is already set by pushing the exam switch up. Now it doesn't matter what I do with the switches. The address bus stays where it is. So with the address bus set to the first byte of the bootloader program, the next thing I have to do is tell that bootloader program what I want it to do when it runs. And the first thing I need to do is uh, well, as soon as it as soon as it boots in, it's going to need to know where the disk drive um, is located, and this is a uh, virtual two SIO board. And in order for it to work, I need to set the first three 
address bits or the highest order address bits down which becomes 0, 0, 0, 0001 everything else stays the way it is and with this in place and mind you the address bus is still set where I had it before at FF00 but the next thing it's going to do is look at these switches and read them in and use them as data and as I previously mentioned when you're loading the address bus from the switches all 16 switches are used and loaded into the address bus but when you're setting data only the lowest order eight switches are used and the upper eight are ignored and when you're actually running a program the upper eight switches can be read sort of as an operator input device and used in the program so the program as soon as I run it at FF00 is going to be looking at these switches and it really wants to see this 0001 binary pattern here so as soon as I do that I'm going to put the program in run and now you can see that the address lights are flickering and so on and that's because it's executing a program now over here looking away from the Altair for the moment to the uh, terminal emulator it, you, you can see that it's booted into Altair, Altair disk extended basic and the first thing it wants to know is what's the memory size and if I push enter which would have been return back then it just goes and uses the maximum memory that it can find in the computer and now it wants to know if I've got a line printer and the proper response for this at this time is a capital letter zero and now it wants to know what the highest disk number is this one has three virtual disks being drive 0, drive 1, and drive 2, so I'm going to put in a 2. It wants to know how many files. Uh, the proper response for that is 4. And how many random files, once again, the response is 4. So now it comes back with uh, the fact that it has found uh, a little over 32 thousand bytes available for use by basic so at this point it is running basic and it's just waiting on me to make a response and you can't really see it on the Altair lights at this point because it's doing so little and it's happening so fast you can't really see it happening now I think it's interesting to note that if you look here all the address lights seem to be pretty static they're all the same intensity and it doesn't seem like anything's going on but yet the program is running and basically what it's doing is it's just pulling the keyboard to see if I push something otherwise it's doing nothing it's just running a little loop to see if I've entered something because it doesn't have a program a basic program to run yet um, it's just running its own little routine and basic saying hey the operator hasn't pushed a key I'm just gonna sit here with my arms folded so it's doing very little but every time I push a key it has to service that and um, on the screen here you can see when I push the enter key that it is processing that and shifting everything up but now I'm going to put in a bit of a program, it's just a single line program and this will be to tell it to print a number print 4 and it dutifully did that, it printed the number 4 that's a very small basic program but it's so small it's only a single line program, it doesn't even have a line number so I could make it a little fancier by saying line number 10 is print 2 plus 2 and then enter it 
and because I gave it a line number it doesn't execute it right away. If I just gave it an immediate command print 4 plus 4 oops hopefully it'll let me do this print 4 plus 4 that's an immediate command uh, because it doesn't have a line number so it just does it right away as soon as I hit enter and of course I got the requisite answer of 0 so now I'm going to actually run my little program which is just line 10 and then print 2 plus 2 and it printed the answer of 4 I could make a little fancier program typing over my existing line 10 and put in a for next loop and say for variable i equals 1 2 10 enter so that's the first line then I'll put in line 20 print variable i and then line 30 third line of my program next i so it's going to set i to 1 print out the contents of i which would be 1 and then encounter the next command which tells it to go back to line 10 increment i to 2 print it out do it again, this time printing 3, next time doing 4, and when it finally has done it 10 times it will exit the program. So I can list my program here, and it'll print out the program again for my viewing pleasure. This is mostly useful if I've done any edits and I just want to see the whole thing resorted the way it's going to execute. So now I can run, And there it's dutifully run the program and it's printed out 1 through 10. So again, a very simple program, but it proves that BASIC is running. Now I'm going to go back and look at the lights on the front of the Altair and see what happens when I push run. So I've got run ready to go. I'm going to push enter. And looking at the lights here, you could see probably there was a little burp there as it executed the program and now it's back just waiting for me to do something. It's already done it so very little going on in the program. I'll do that again. So just for about a half a second was there any activity besides just doing a simple wait routine. Let's give it something a little longer. I'm going to list line 10 and I'm going to, I don't remember the command for this, so I'm just going to re-enter it. 10 for i equals 1 to 10,000. I'm going to list to make sure the program looks okay. And now I'm going to run and I can expect to see the lights on the Altair doing something for a little longer period of time. See how long it actually takes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. 14, 15, 16, 17. You can see it's taking a while. This is no speed demon. I would have put in a smaller number if I would have realized it was going to take this long. But it'll get there. Almost done now. And 10,000 and we're done. So let me try another little program here.
for i equals 0 to 100, I'm going to pretend like that's degrees Celsius. Uh, let's see. I'm not really sure what the implementation of BASIC is here, how much I can do. I'm used to the more powerful versions of BASIC, so I'm going to strip this down and make it very simple. I'm going to say A equals I times So there's a little program. It's going to overflow the screen, so that's all right. Let's do a list. type this for I equals 0 to oh let's say 20 see if it understands this shouldn't need to do that verify my whole program looks all right So that was a little Celsius to Fahrenheit conversion program and it started with a value of 0 degrees Celsius which we know is 32 degrees Fahrenheit and then it went all the way up and gave us the Celsius or the uh, Fahrenheit values. Uh, if I relist this and I'm going to change 10 Change it back to what I originally had it. Verify my program and run my program. So the loop ended with a value of 100 degrees Celsius and the program turned out a value of 212 which of course we know is the uh, equivalent Fahrenheit value uh, going from the zero Celsius being the freezing point of water or 32 degrees and going up to 100 Celsius or the boiling point of water or 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is just a very simple example of how a program can be very simple and still do something useful and I could have formatted a little differently to show the Celsius with the Fahrenheit next to it so you could actually get a usable table and if I had this hooked up to a printer, I could have printed out the table, but I think you get the general idea. Apparently clear doesn't do what I remembered it doing. But um, anyway, so there is 
a simple example of Altair Basic in operation and several small simple programs.